uh, to be able to witness an attorney actually arguing a case before a court uh, when a client is looking for his or her own lawyer. Um, back in 2003, I was approached to represent a man who had been uh, unjustly convicted of first-degree murder back in 1990, and he served 16 years in prison for a murder he did not commit. Um, I appeared before the Superior Court. Codified in Title 42 USC 1988, which means that I am not a member of the Hawaii Bar Association nor the American Bar Association. I do not have a license to practice law because there is no such license. Uh, neither does the plaintiff attorneys have a license to practice law. What they have is a certificate of admission or a membership dues to the bar. A lot bar of people have questions on power of attorney and they want to know what is a power of attorney? What is it and and why do I need it I have a will why would I need power of attorney well the very first thing I want to draw your attention to the Grand Canyon so if you think in your mind of the Grand Canyon on one side you have life on the other side you have death so the death side is where you have the will that's where you have your executor that's where you have your guardian for young children that's where you leave your estate to your children or your friend or whoever on the other side is incapacity where you're living but unable to act for yourself. Whether you're 18 and hit your heads on the hockey boards or whether you're 99 with Alzheimer's, it doesn't matter. You need two, two power of attorneys in Ontario. One is a power of attorney for property and one is a power of attorney for medical care. And then you need a will. So you need three documents. Your, people often call me on radio shows and say to me, my power of attorney is in my will I say, no, it's not in your will. It's a separate freestanding document, and you need two of them. And your will's a separate document. So let's talk about power of attorney for finances. The first question I want to ask everybody here is, I'm sure we're going to see everybody put their hands up. How many people here would like to see the government of Ontario run their financial affairs if you become incapacitated? I don't see too many people. <laughs> okay, so I don't see anybody, but okay, so I agree with you. I don't want the government running mine. I'm sure they do a great job. They're wonderful people. But I don't want them running my affairs. And most of my clients and most of my listeners on radio and TV do not want the government involved in their affairs. As a matter of fact, many people who come to my office work for the government, and they still don't want the government involved in their affairs. Okay? So let's talk now about what can happen. You're healthy. You're 18. You're 80, 90, whatever. You're driving on the highway. It's a beautiful sunny day and a truck tire hits you, and your car flips, and you smash your head on the windshield, and you're incapacitated. Under the law of Ontario, what would happen in that case is that you'd be taken to a major hospital in Ontario, and if one doctor in that hospital, in the psychiatric facility of that hospital, asks you financial questions and says, Charlie, um, what's 10 times 10? What's your phone number? Uh, what's your, where's your bank? Uh, how much is 100 plus 100? If you can't answer those types of questions because of that accident, the doctor must, under the law of Ontario, send a certificate of incapacity to the government. And once the government of Ontario receives that certificate of incapacity, they automatically, and I underline the word automatically,